How many times in my life have I shown zeal for God, but it hasn't been based on knowledge? Like, I show passion for righteousness and what I think is right and which way things should be, but it's not based in in an actual knowledge of God. And that word knowledge here means a heart knowing, a mind knowing, the essence of belief is not something that happens just in our head. It's not about a doctrine that we can just recite. It's about a heart transformation. Hey everyone, welcome back to How to Study the Bible. My name is Nicole Yunus, and I'm so glad to be your host and your guide, your companion as we study the book of Romans together. It's been so rich. You guys have enriched my life uh, through your comments, your emails, Um, I got an email just this week from someone who said that being back in the Bible through this process and this journey has been life-changing for her as she has been overseas in the National Guard and having an opportunity to be in the Word with us um, has met her in some very difficult moments in the past year. What a gift it is to get to do this together and to harness the power of technology for bringing the good news. And it is good news. It is good news. And I know last chapter, Romans chapter 9, can be difficult in that it requires us to wrestle with uncertainty and to wrestle with uh, mystery. But Romans chapter 10 brings us right around to some incredible certainty about what the good news really means. We've titled this chapter, A Fork in the Road, because in your reading plan that you can still join us on, still join our Facebook group if you're just joining us now, it's not too late to jump in. In the reading plan, we talk a little bit more and extensively, more extensively about the Old Testament law. But today on the podcast, I want to focus on a slightly different part of the chapter that really is the fork in the road about salvation, about the Israelites and Gentiles and who the message of the Lord is really for. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. If you want to read along, if you want to pause the podcast so that you can grab your Bible, your journal, your notes, please join me uh, as we just take a deep breath and we enter into God's Word together, knowing that He meets us, that His Word is living and active, that God um, has affection toward us, that He is inclining himself and his revelation toward us in a way that's designed to bring us life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hey, how's that for certainty? Chapter uh, chapter 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. Okay, so let's talk about what this says. Let's just come up and elevate our perspective and just ask the question, okay, what is this telling us right now as we listen to these words, as you read the chapter or skim this passage quickly? I think there's a couple things that we um, hear here that we can pull out, kind of three things. The first is, this gives us a clear understanding of how salvation works. If you've ever been like, am I saved, or you doubt your salvation, or you've tried to counsel or encourage someone who's like, I don't know if I feel like, have I done it? Is Jesus really in my heart? Am I really a Christian? This gives you a clear understanding of how salvation works. Second, this gives us a need to understand the gospel witness, meaning the story, the story of the good news. Um, What is the need for that? And three, it's about why we care about telling our story. Like, why does it matter that we live in faith? And I think that's a big question, a big theological question that we see here in Romans. And I think a big question that we have to ask our whole life, which is, what is God's to do and what is mine to do? 
And this is a, a place where theological debates rage for generation after generation. What is God doing and what am I doing? Wait, am I predestined? Are people predestined to heaven or to hell? Does God change? Does he change his mind? We talked about that last chapter. We have these questions. What is God's to do? And what is mine to do? And if you have that question, as we all do often, we have to wrestle through that. Um, we get a clear understanding of how salvation works in this passage, and that is such good news. So let's talk a little bit about the backstory that we find here. And the backstory, remember, when we ask the question, what's the backstory? We want to understand the passage that we're reading in the context that it's written. So this is a book, it's a letter that was written at a particular time to a particular people for a particular reason. And we're studying the book together because it gives us a chance to be in that context. So in the big in the big world of like what's the backstory, you do want to understand this was written at a particular time for a particular people for a particular reason. And we want to know that. We want to understand what was it written for at the time that it was written. And then when we ask that question, what does it mean? We're building that bridge over to modern day to say, what is the truth here that we can extrapolate that's the same then as it is now. The same truth then as it is now. And this is where we get into really what biblical interpretation is, because we're asking the question, when we read something like women should cover their heads in prayer, is that a contextual, meaning is that about the culture then, and it's about a deeper, uh, the deeper principle, for instance, uh, the deeper principle there is about respect and worship, respect and order in worship. Is that's the deeper principle, or are we actually supposed to cover our heads in worship? So that's a thing that goes back and forth with people all the time is how much is this is like, it matters exactly the same then as it does now. And there's lots of ways that we do that. And that's an ongoing process. So if you can be comfortable with the fact that that's an ongoing process, oftentimes people who want certainty will decide to take everything literally in scripture, like literally meaning this isn't about the culture of the day, it's about forever culture. And the weird thing about that is that Jesus himself didn't do that, nor did Paul. Jesus and Paul often will take scripture and reappropriate it from the Old Testament into the New. They'll say, hey, this is what happened in the Old Testament. This is what it means for us today. And so we do that same thing when we interpret scripture. We're asking the question, what does this mean for us today? It doesn't mean that we can just throw stuff out. In fact, if you just think the Bible agrees with everything that you agree with, then you may need help with your interpretation, because all of us on some level should be uncomfortable with something in Scripture. It should give us that pause, like, okay, how do I interpret this? How do I understand it? And there's people who have differing opinions on that interpretation. That's part of being in the body of Christ. But just because there's different interpretations doesn't mean that we shouldn't apply a rigorous interpretive mind to what we're reading. And what we're doing is asking, what did it mean then? And what's the principle for what it means now? Okay, so thankfully, this week, in this passage, this piece that we're reading is very clear. Like, what it meant then is what it means now, because it's talking about the human heart, right? So what's happened up to this point, though, in chapter 10, before we got to verse 9, is we hear a little bit more about what went on or what is going on with the Israelites. It starts with, hey, I, Paul, you know, expresses his anguish and his trouble, wishing that everyone um, and wanting everyone to be saved. But he also talks about this idea in verse two, where it says, hey, I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. And I don't know, you guys, when I read that today, I was so convicted, like, ooh, oh, how many times in my life have I shown zeal? for God, but it hasn't been based on knowledge. Like I show passion for righteousness and what I think is right and wh which way things should be, but it's not based in, a, in an actual knowledge of God. And that word knowledge here means a heart knowing, a mind knowing, the essence of belief is not something that happens just in our head. It's not about a doctrine that we can just recite. It's about a heart transformation. And that's what a deep knowing is, is about an experience of a person creates a deep knowing, not an experience of facts, not just like doctrine and facts, but truly knowledge. So 
That's what we're talking about when we're looking at this passage is Paul is grieving that there are those out there who are zealous for God, but they don't live in the knowledge of God. And then he begins to lay out what that knowledge is, that through Christ, the righteousness for all has been revealed, and there's no difference between Israelite and Gentile because of the way of salvation that we hear about in the passage that we read. So we want to understand that that's he's actually saying, hey, this has been revealed to people, but not everyone will accept it. And that's true today, that, that, that God is revealing himself to people, but not everyone will accept that knowledge. But then Paul goes on with this very, very certain and optimistic spirited passage about how we come to know Christ and what does it look like to be saved. And so he talks about this idea of if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. P.S., I recommend memorizing that. In fact, this whole passage, at least this first part that talks about salvation, memorizing that. We all need it. We all need this reminder. If you're not sure about your salvation, if you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't feel saved, this is your verse. This is the verse for you. This is a verse about inward belief and outward confession, okay? And now here's a very, very important part in the backstory. This idea of heart, okay? So it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's easy to understand. Like we can do that. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, right? So what does the heart mean? In biblical terms, when the heart is used in the Bible, it's not just about emotion. It's not about how you feel. It's about an inward conviction, your intelligence and your will. So setting your will toward a truth. So I'm going to I'm going to will myself toward a truth. I'm going to turn my body, I'm going to turn my heart and turn my mind toward a truth. And my feelings will follow. If you're going to sit around just hoping that you feel sort of saved, redeemed, not guilty, unashamed, just hoping that that feeling is actually telling you that you're a Christian, you're going to be buffeted back and forth by the winds of your emotions. Your feelings are going to take you back and forth, and and then you're going to feel very insecure in your faith. But when you understand that when the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about a fully orbed will. Like, I am going to believe this, okay? Now, eventually your emotion follows, eventually, but the battle of our heart is often played out in our emotion. That's the place where the enemy whispers from our past and whispers shame and insecurity in fear into our mind. And we have to do the work of having our mind transformed, Romans chapter 12, we'll get to get to that soon, of having our minds transformed to be conformed into the image of Christ. So if you're waiting for your feelings to tell you that you're saved, you're going to be disappointed. Or, or if I, even more importantly, you're going to be maybe fine today and disappointed tomorrow. You're going to be waffling back and forth. But if you understand that to be saved is to state an outward confession, I believe that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Lord of my life. And to have an inward conviction, to set my heart to say, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Then you're saved. (laughs) That's the whole thing. Isn't that great? Isn't that so great? So yes, is the Bible deep and full of nuance and story? Yes. Is there so much for us to discover? Yes. Is it hard to understand how to be saved? No, it's not hard to understand how to be saved. That's what I love about the book of Romans is we've got over and over again. I mean, Paul says it three different ways. He's like, listen, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Those are just true statements. It is with certainty that you can understand that. And if you're listening right now and you're like, have I done that? Is this just a faith by osmosis? I'm just exploring. Today is the day. This moment is the moment. This is the moment where you can set your will and say, yes, right now, out loud, I'm going to say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm going to, I want to, I'm going to live as Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm not Lord of my life anymore. Jesus is Lord of my life. And the second thing you do is that this belief in your heart that Jesus, God raised Jesus from the dead. Like God proved his love for us and he proved his power over sin and over our sin 
through the sacrifice of his son. Jesus Christ went to the cross where he did the work of being the ultimate sacrifice for us, past, present, and future, all of our sin. And not only that, it wasn't just a death. It wasn't just like, oh, Jesus is going to sacrifice for us, end of story. No, actually, the death resulted in a resurrection, just as it will for us. So when we say in our heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, what I'm saying is I believe it's possible to be raised from the dead. I, I believe in resurrection. I believe that this isn't the end of the story. I believe that Jesus has made a way for me to be at eternal peace with my Father in heaven, that there is, there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, because it's just an ultimate reality that Jesus is Lord. The question is, do I want to turn my will toward that truth? And that's what it means to be a Christian. So if you've done those things, if you've said, yes, I'm saying with my mouth, even right now, say it out loud in your car, say it out loud in your kitchen, I believe Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Lord of my life. I take myself off the throne of my own lordship and I put Jesus as Lord of my life. I am here to serve him. And I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, which means I believe in resurrection. I believe that Jesus has done something that no man has ever done. And in doing so, he has made a way for all of us to be resurrected. And if you want to take it even further, I mean, the fruit of that belief, guys, do you know what the fruit of that belief is? We don't have to live in fear. We don't live in fear of death. We don't live in fear of trouble. We don't live in fear of turmoil. We don't live in fear of relational death or, or physical death because our spiritual life is secure and eternal. Now, does that mean it's still scary and troubling and hard to live in this world? Absolutely. But there's a way big difference between, man, gosh, I'm, I'm struggling today, Lord. I believe in you and you can, you can strengthen me. There's a huge difference between that and actually embodying the fear of death in your life, <laughs> the fear that you have to protect and control and tribalize and secure all of your stuff because everything could be taken from you. No, the thing that is most important to you, your soul can never be taken from you when you have confessed that Jesus is Lord and when you believe that God has raised him from the dead. I didn't mean to say all that, y'all, but somebody needed that today. And if that's you and you needed that today, I want you to know that the power of the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. This message is for you. And for the rest of you who know Jesus as Lord and you're just encouraged to hear this, the next part of this passage is for you. I love this next part of this passage, which is like, look at this good news. But how will people believe it if they don't hear it? And how will they hear it if people aren't out there doing it? And how are they out there doing it if they're not sent out to do it? This is really the, the crux of the understanding of why we tell our story, why we believe that it is important to witness to our faith, that we aren't just like pawns in God's game and God's just moving pawns around the board and we're not part of it. He's actually inviting us to be part of it. He's saying, you are a part of it. The way that the gospel is moved forward in the world is story by story by story. It's your story told to another because your feet are proclaiming the good news where you go. And your faith is built on the story that somebody told you. And what I love here that Paul quotes, he quotes from Isaiah when he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So this is where it's in, um, I'm sorry, verse 15, where it says, how can anyone hear if no one's preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Here's the whole verse. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And what's cool about this chapter that I love, the context of Isaiah 52, is that when that prophecy was written, it was really it was written as a the good news about being released from captivity and bondage. You can actually find this in your study notes under 1015. It's going to say in your study notes in your NIV Bible, the one I'm using is an NIV study Bible, and it says, this quote quotation is from Isaiah 52, 7, which refers to those who bring the exiles the good news of their imminent release from captivity in Babylonia. Here it applies to gospel preachers who bring the good news of release from captivity to sin. See, this is what the good news is. When we talk about the good news, what we're seeing here is that the good news of salvation is equivocated to the good news in the Old Testament of being released from captivity and bondage. 
You see, the problem with with sin is that it ultimately creates bondage. It ultimately makes us slaves. And and when we realize, oh my gosh, this thing that I thought was good, that makes me feel good, or that my, my own self-driven agenda or my own way of living in this world is actually is, is actually making me a prisoner. And I'm I'm so trapped by this insecurity, this anxiety, this fear, this greed, this guilt, this this people pleasing, whatever the thing is. And that the actual good news is released from captivity from that. And P.S. Don't for a minute think that when it says gospel preachers, it means people that have been to educated, you know, been educated in seminary and who are paid to preach the gospel. This is talking about everyone. Every one of us who's received the gospel is called to preach the gospel. Now, does God lay, set people apart as teachers? Absolutely. Should we support those people? Does God call people to be missionaries? A hundred percent. Should we support them financially with our prayer? Yes. But this is not a pass for all of us because anyone who's heard the good news should proclaim the, the good news because that's how the good news goes to the world. That's what God is telling us in this chapter. All right, y'all, I've gotten fired up. So let's wrap up. Uh, third question, what does it mean? Here's what I wrote, just very simply. What are the principles from this passage? The first one was written for us in the passage. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, isn't that just such good news? It's the same good news then when this was a letter written to the Romans in the early church. It's the same good news for us today in 2021. It will be the same good news that will be proclaimed until Jesus comes again. The second thing, the second principle I see at play here in this passage is we have the honor of being part of the work of sending and proclaiming so that those can hear and believe. We have the honor of being part of that work. God calls us to that work. In his mystery, he invites us into the process. So what does it mean for me? So I've written kind of two questions to wrap up that I'm asking myself uh, from this chapter, and I would encourage you to ask yourself as well. The first one is this, am I guilty of having zeal without knowledge? And what I mean by knowledge, remember, is that deep heart knowing, heart knowledge of my own freedom from captivity. The minute we start having zeal, that isn't connected to our own heart knowledge of the way that we ourselves have been children of wrath, the way that we ourselves have been been in bondage to sin. When we disconnect those two things, what enters in is self-righteousness. What enters in is judgment and pride. And so we have to ask, am I a person who has zeal with heart knowledge about the way that God has saved me? And I want to keep those coupled together. And then my second question is this, have I thanked God recently for bringing me the good news? Have I honored the people in my story who have been a part of bringing me the good news? Maybe there's someone that you want to reach out to today that you want to thank, that you want to send a text, maybe even write a note to say thank you for living a life, living a gospel life that helped me come to know the gospel because that's the way our faith is built and that's the way our faith begins. And that's the way someone else's faith will begin when you yourself embody that sharing heart knowledge of what it means to be saved. Go in peace, everyone. Talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice, a production of LifeAudio.com and the Salem Web Network. This episode was produced by Kelly Givens and our executive producer, Stephen McGarvey and edited by Stephen Sanders. If you enjoyed what you heard today, we'd love for you to head over to your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. It really does help people find us. To learn more about Nicole, you can check out her website at NicoleEunice.com. Her book on how to study the Bible is called Help, My Bible is Alive. And you can find a link to that, plus a link to Nicole's site in today's show notes.